grow these other fruits. And I'm going to uh, refer to this both for uh, small farms and for backyards. So, uh, so not having pesticides would be an asset for both those sites. In a backyard, you might want to grow uncommon fruits because a lot of them are quite ornamental. Some of them are actually are grown as ornamentals. This is a, a photo along my driveway. I used to have forsythia there, which is very nice in the spring, but then it's sort of, uh, you don't look at it again. So this is uh, a fruit that we'll refer back to in a little while. It's called Nanking cherry. It's, it's really awesome in the spring when it's in bloom, but when it finishes bloom, you still can enjoy the plant, you enjoy all these uh, cherries. So I'll get back to this one. So the, the fruits that I'm going to talk about also, there's a lot of fruits that are edible, but they're not really that tasty. So the fruits I'm going to talk about are not survival fruits. These are fruits that really you would just pop into your mouth and they're delicious to dessert fruits. And the third reason to, to grow them is because they're uncommon. So here's a, some of the uncommon fruits that ripen in summer. And if you happen to like may pops or pawpaws, uh, you're not going to likely find them at your uh, farm stand or in your supermarket, so you have to grow them. And as I said, uh, there's a lot of commercial reasons to grow these fruits also. So here's some of the uh, uncommon fruits of fall. Some of them I'll some of them I won't. But uh, one thing, if you have a small farm, diversity, diversification is always good. In case you get a crop failure with one fruit, uh, you probably won't get a crop failure with all your fruits. And uh, so I grow all these fruits in, in uh, the colder part of Zone 5 in New York's Hudson Valley. And basically every year I have a lot of fruit just because some years some fruits fa fail, but I have so many different ones. So diversification is one reason to grow them on a small farm. Sustainability. So apples, for instance, uh, when the way they're conventionally grown in the east require maybe 20 or 30 pesticide sprays for the season. The fruits I'm going to talk about have um, much fewer pet problems, some, in some cases nothing significant. So generally they will not need any spring, and uh, some of them don't even need any pruning. So that's another reason. Flavor. They have unique flavors that really um, you can't find anywhere else. So this, this is another appeal to fruits. And then the last reason, especially on a small farm, they're really ideal for specialty markets, uh, ethnic markets, organic markets, <laughs> so, and especially for those fruits that ship poorly, it's, it's, they're ideal for, um, for if, you, if you live near a metropolitan area or if you live where tourists, there's a tourist influence, this is where people, even if they don't ship well, people can just come and pick them up. So, that, so that's, that hopefully makes a case for uh, growing some of these, <clears throat> or at least considering to grow some of these uncommon fruits, as I like to call them, which I'll, I'll talk about. So what I want to do is divide this talk into three sections. The first is going to be a quick run through just to show you the spectrum of uncommon fruits. Uh, it'll be sort of an uncommon fruit sampler. Then I want to talk about, in the second part, some ornamental plants that also bear tasty fruits. And this would be ideal for what some people call edible landscaping. I like to call it luscious landscaping. And then the third part will be for uh, some fruits that have been cultivated and improved uh, by a small yet dedicated following, and uh, and these also would have some commercial appeal. So uh, one thing to start out, I've been trying to remember to uh, talk about any problems that these fruits, any of the, each of these fruits can have, because you know no no plant is perfect. The rose has its thorns, et cetera. But generally they are easy to grow. And also, as I said, these Plants are generally cold, cold hardy. Uh, as I'm, I'm in the colder part of zone five, but a lot of uh, hardy below zone five. So let's start with the uncommon fruit sampler. <clears throat> we'll take a quick run through to give you just an idea that especially of fruits that can be grown once you break away from the common. So first one is a fruit called gumi, and it's uh, in the Eleagnus genus. It ripens in July. Uh, its assets are the fruit actually is a little astringent and tart, but it also has a really good flavor. Uh, this is a fruit that if somebody wanted to do some breeding could really be improved. It's a beautiful fruit. It's grown on a plant that has a lot of assets. The uh, plant is quite ornamental. It's a large shrub, and uh, and it's very fragrant in the spring. Very, uh, you know, no pest problem to speak of. 
and another asset of the plant is the nitrogen. It fixes nitrogen, so it can improve the soil. The one downside I'll say to this fruit, as far as I'm concerned, is where I am, the birds really eat just about all of them. But I know other places where the birds do not eat them. So that's the first one. Second one, a lot of you uh, might recognize this as a passion plant. And as I said, all these fruits are hardy fruits, uh, but there is one species of passion flower that's native to eastern U.S. as far north as Virginia, but it's a herbaceous perennial, so it dies from the ground, and the roots actually can survive for an average year of year. So the plant dies to the ground, then in late spring, it will send up new shoots that flower and fruit that same season. So this is a plant, very beautiful plant. And uh, very pest free. And here's what the fruit looks like. If you've never had passion fruit, it's the main flavor in wine punch. And uh, just as a, it's sort of like a pomegranate, where the seeds have this uh, sort of flesh around it that you that you eat. Okay, another fruit, a lot of you probably familiar with this alpine strawberry. There are di different species than uh, the conventional corn strawberry, and the plants are different. They're smaller. They uh, don't make rum. Plus, the fruit is super fragrant and tasty. And you can see in my hand in this photo, there's a, a white ones and red ones. So the white ones are right. The white varieties and the red varieties. I didn't. I never found much difference between the red varieties or between the white varieties. But there's a big difference between the white ones and the red ones. And I happen to like the white ones a lot better. They have uh, some with pineapple flavor. And the best thing about them is the birds don't eat them, so you can really get them dead right. But this one actually uh, sometimes is sold commercially in very fancy food stores. And, uh, it's very hard to move because they're very soft when they're ripe. So, so perfect for home garden. Uh, you know, not impossible to do commercially. Here's what I've got in my garden in pots where they're easy to, easier to manage and, and, and keep an eye on. Here's a very uncommon fruit, it's called Chipotle. It's an intergenetic hybrid involving pear and mountain ash. Very, very tasty fruit, it's sort of a meaty texture and, uh, and a pear-like flavor. Um, can't say much else about it except that you should taste it. Here's what the plant looks like, nice ornamental plant, a lot of flowers, and the leaves have sort of a whitish cast in the spring. This one of the fruits that's not that good fresh, but makes a delicious juice. It's called sea berry. And uh, this would make, if you could process it, this would make a good uh, commercial fruit. Uh, it's uh, allegedly very high in, in health promoting factors. And you can see the berries, uh, uh, many of them, they attach right, right to the stems. And uh, you need a separate male plant which can pollinate up to eight female plants, and there's a number of varieties available. And uh, it's very, very tasty, it's a very rich orange juice with a little pineapple added to it. Here's the way the bush looks like. It's, this bush has been grown as ornamental. And here's what I make out of it. I make a juice, and then of course, it's, a, it's from Russia, so I call it Siberian pineapple aperitif. And basically everyone that tasted it really loved it. The only criticism I got was somebody said it would uh, benefit from a little uh, vodka added to it. But very tasty, very helpful, and very easy to grow. Uh, here I am in Hungary. This is uh, my heath bed. Uh, heath is in the heath family of plants that all like very acidic conditions, and poor soils, but soils that are very high in organic matter. So this is a bed that contains two, two excellent common fruit. One is lowest berry, which a lot of people harvest from the wild, but not make a plant. This is a young plant, and with time, the plant spread by underground runners to basically fill in like a ground cover. And uh, very easy to grow, very ornamental, pretty flowers in the spring, uh, they healthy all summer, and then they have good fall color. And uh, the plants never grow more than about 18 inches high. And here's the other plant that's in that bed. This is a lingonberry, which is uh, very popular in Scandinavia, but can be grown in the colder parts of this uh, northeast. Uh, it's very similar, likes the same conditions as, uh, as 
was um, low bush blueberry. Very similar. It's often been compared with the cranberry. The diff- a few differences are first of all, much more ornamental because the leaves have this nice bright green look all winter. They're evergreen, and the fruit actually I think tastes a lot better than a cranberry. I just sometimes eat them straight up. You just pop them in your mouth, and they're really good tasting. And this, like the low bush blueberry, makes a nice ground cover. Grows about six inches high, and actually spreads by underground runners to fill in the uh, the whole bed. So this uh, obviously is not a fruit. This is a sorbet, and this is the palate cleanser. But that was the quick run through the uh, the fruit sampler. So I want everyone to clean their palate, cleanse their palate, while we move into the second part of this uh, fruit uh, circus. And uh, and this would be uh, what I'd like to talk next about. Is everybody finished with the sorbet? Okay. I want. I'll talk about some ornamental uncommon fruit plants, which are really good for, as I call it, luscious landscaping. And, uh, you know, a lot of these fruits are grown as landscape plants, and they fruit, and people don't even realize that there's fruit on the plants that they're growing, so they don't eat them. But here they are. So one of the first ones, uh, which is a red plant, is cold current. This is a type of current that's native from Minnesota down to Texas, and if anybody of you has ever lived in the Midwest, you know how brutal uh, climate conditions are there. It could be super hot in the summer and super cold in the winter. This thing can take cold, it can take heat, it can take insects, it can take, it has no disease problems, no insect problems, and even deer leave this plant alone. So it's, and it has been grown in the past as an ornamental, maybe a hundred years ago, it was grown as an ornamental. But in addition, not only is ornamental grown for its flowers, which are ornamental, but also they're super fragrant. Uh, matter of fact, I find it hard to work out in the garden during the week or so that this plant is in bloom because it's, it's like so heady, you start to hyperventilate. So of course, it's also fruits. So it has these fruits, they're sweet fruits, good, uh, just popped into your mouth after, um, if somebody could make a jam. I'm not a good jam maker. You can make really good jams and pies with them also. So the one potential downside to this plant are sort of rangy growing. Uh, it has long, uh, well, has arching branches that arch to the ground. It also sends out suckers uh, that spread underneath the ground, even a few feet from the plant. But uh, so if you have a very formal site, this would not be the plant for it. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, have like a bank, like people sometimes plant forsythia on a bank just to hold back the soil and to look nice, you could possibly use this and then you get fruit off of And you could keep it more in line. I actually wrote a, gr- a book on pruning called The Pruning Book. So I decided since I wrote a book on pruning, I should be able to make this plant do whatever I wanted. So I actually mm-hmm. trained a whole bunch of them as little trees, which is exactly what they don't want to do, but I just want to show them who's boss. So the next fruit that is a great landscape plant, and this one also is very good, has a lot of commercial potential. If I was going to uh, grow an uncommon fruit commercially, actually I do grow this one commercially, uh, this would be one of them. So it's hardy kiwi fruit. Uh, used to be called Bauer Actinidia. It was Planted as an ornamental in America for about 100 years, for about 100 years, and then up to the 1980s, and then people started noticing there were green fruits on them, and that they were really tasty. So first, first let me look at some of the ornamental aspects. Here's what the leaves look like. They have all different types of variegation. You have that, you got that. There's another one. So a lot of old estates, uh, like Old Westbury Gardens, Arnold Arboretum, they have uh, these plants that were grown as ornamentals. So here, uh, there's two acts, there's two species that are generally used as or, uh, for their fruit. One is Actinidia arguta, and the other one's Actinidia colomicta. So let me just compare them. If you look, Actinidia arguta ripens in September. Uh, I have some that are ripening just now. A few ripened earlier. Actinidia colomicta ripens in August. I think it's very rampant grown. You have to put up some sturdy structure on which to train them. Colomicta is more dwarf. The, generally, the arguta is what's grown as a commercial fruit. 
possibly because it uh, ripens in the fall, so it holds better on the plant. It doesn't ripen and go overripe so quickly. And then Colomicus ripen in the ripen area. <clears throat> the uh, Arguda has apple green leaves, red petioles, very ornamental. Those photos I showed of the leaves before, that was uh, uh, Actinidia colomicta leaves. And this plant is often called as Arctic cuta. Here's the way the fruits look compared with the uh, conventional uh, fuzzy uh, fruit. So you can see that they're smaller. Uh, they have a smooth green skin, so you just pop them into your mouth just like grapes. You see inside, they look the same. pretty much anyone who tastes this fruit agrees that the, the, the hardy kiwi fruit tastes better uh, than the fuzzy kiwi fruit. They're sweeter and they have uh, more aromatics. The best thing, uh, one of the best things to me about the, uh, growing my own hardy kiwi fruit is they don't have those uh, little tags on them, which uh, you know start to accumulate. Okay, so one thing about hardy kiwi fruit does need pruning, especially the Actinidia argutus. Here's the way I train mine, and I love to train them like this. It's a trellis, five wire trellis. A trunk goes up to the middle wire of the trellis, and then a permanent cordon going in either direction on each side of the trellis. And then you have fruiting arms that grow up the cordon and drape over the uh, other wires. So the, the act argument that gets a lot of fruiting each year. Here's uh, my. Here's my uh, my arguta before pruning, and the, the the goals in pruning are very much the same as pruning grapes. You want to keep the plant organized, you want to keep it easy to harvest, you don't want it to be feet up in a tree, and you want to be able to maintain productivity every year so that uh, you know you don't get a big crop one year and no crop the next year. So here it is before pruning. Here it is when pruning's almost finished. So what's what's left is I have to thin out a few. Or those uh, fruiting arms is a little too many and they have to be shortened. And then if you do everything right, here's the way it looks. You walk underneath that arbor and just you know, the fruits just hang down and they're really easy to pop off and you just uh, you can eat them where you can actually harvest it. This is an excellent commercial fruit because you can harvest it a little underripe and it will ripen really well. Uh, onto you know after in, under refrigeration or faster at room temperature. So the uh, uh, potential problems. One, as I said, you do have to prune this plant. Uh, basically, uh, just to say a non-problem. Uh, basically, no pest problem is really to speak of. And uh, and you do need separate male and female plants. And as with the other plants, one male can pollinate up to about eight female plants, but a male colmita can pollinate female or guta or vice versa. So you need the same species. Okay, this fruit, uh, some of you may be familiar with. It's a native fruit. It's native in every state. Uh, June berry, sometimes called amelanchier, sometimes called saskatoon, sometimes called service berry, sometimes called shadbush. And they come in tree size and shrub size. This is a wild one growing in the woods, typically in mid-April. Uh, you can see that in flowering in the woods. Here's another species, a, a bushier species in the woods. Here's an ornamental one. This one actually is widely planted as an ornamental. has really nice fall color, has nice bark, nice neat growth habit, uh, nice flowers in the spring. So it's a nice ornamental. Is well, one, one particular variety called Autumn Blaze that was selected specifically for its ornamental uh, qualities. And here's what the fruit looks like. The fruit is often compared to blueberry because it looks like a blueberry. Uh, in fact, it's not a berry. It's a pump fruit like apple and pear. And in fact, it does not taste like a blueberry at all. It has the sweetness and richness of a sweet cherry with a little almond after taste. And it's really quite delicious, and, and uh, potentially this could make a good commercial fruit. Uh, the problem with this fruit, as a relative of apple and pear, it does get some similar pest problems like like rust and and some insect problems. So some places uh, are more conducive to it than others. Uh, 
on my farm than I can grow they take to my pest problems. I have a very poor site. But a few miles from here, I see that they grow well. So I would suggest trying this because they have a great flavor. And if it doesn't grow well, just cut it down and plant something else. Um, this plant does not need uh, cross-pollination. It's not finicky at all about the soil it's grown in. Um, it's not, it doesn't need any, it needs some pruning, but nothing really uh, too, uh, you know, too artful or scientific. Uh, so, so it's worth a try. Here's another fruit with commercial appeal. Uh, very easy to grow. It's called chameleon cherry. This is actually a species of dogwood, but it makes a cherry-like fruit. And this is a fruit that, uh, believe it or not, has been grown by, eaten by humans for over 7,000 years. The remains of this fruit has been found along with lentils and barley in the other case sites. Um, it was popular among the Greeks and Romans and even in Europe up to the 19th century, uh, but now it's just grown as an ornamental, a widely planted ornamental, and it's grown for its uh, flowers. It's one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. It blooms here typically uh, around the first day of spring. And uh, you know, the way apples and peaches, they bloom early, then they often get frosted and you lose the crop. For some reason, this plant blooms very early, and I've never, in decades, not had a crop on this plant. So it's very reliable. Uh, and as I said, pest free has a lot going for it. Here's what the fruit looks like. The fruit is also quite ornamental. Looks like a tart cherry. Tastes like a tart cherry. With, it, has, it has its own flavor, but it is tart. And um, the flavor, if you let it sit on the tree or in a bowl, the flavor mellows out some. Um, some people, I've actually, uh, when I, I give live presentations about this fruit, I often bring it if it's summer because uh, it has so much eye appeal. Basically, everybody tries it. And about 40% of people don't like it, but about 60% of people do like it. So it's worth a try. <clears throat> and as I said, it has uh, a good commercial potential because it has uh, virtually no pest problems to speak of. Uh, it needs full sun. You know, nothing special about pruning. And uh, one thing is it's partially self-fertile. So one tree will bear, but if you have two different varieties, you'll get more. So this is a close-up of the flower that I showed along my driveway in the spring. This is Nanking cherry. It's a bush cherry. This actually is a true cherry. The, the Cornelian cherry is a dogwood species, but the Nanking cherry is a true cherry species. And it comes from uh, Manchuria, and this plant is native to places where the temperature in winter gets to minus 50 and in summer to 110. So this can take a lot. Basically, the only thing this plant needs is uh, sun. Although I have seen them uh, grow in full shade, but they will not bear flowers like this in full sun. In shade. So, so this one also, uh, even though it blossoms typically uh, mid-April, and often gets hit by frost after, typically this will, will go on to fruit every year. One year out of about, you know, decades of growing this fruit, have I not gotten fruit? And that was uh, just a very, pretty, very cold uh, freeze uh, when they were in full bloom. Uh, so the fruit itself, uh, first of all, here's how prolific it is. You can see, if you look at the branches, if you can take your eyes off of me and look at the branches, uh, you can see that there's fruit just covering all these branches. So some people say, ask me, do the uh, birds eat them? Do squirrels eat them? Do you know chipmunks? Everything eats them, and I eat them. And after we've all partaken of it, you would not think that the plant has been eaten because there's so many. Here's a here's a variety that they, it's called a white variety. It's very pink. But here's if you look at the stem behind my hand, you can see you can hardly see the stem because it's covered so much with cherries. So the two downsides to this cherry, one is you can see the cherries are small. They're like a half to five eighths inch in diameter. Second thing is that uh, they don't have stems on them. The stem stays on the plant. So it leaves sort of a hole in the fruit. So you could not let this sit too long. Um, but on the plus side, uh, uh, there's no new variety to this. But so they, so each plant will not taste exactly the same, but I've tasted a lot of different seedlings 
and they're all somewhere on the spectrum between sweet and tart cherries, but I've never tasted one that was bad. They're really good tasting fruit. And if anybody wanted to become a fruit reader, this would be a plant that I think it starts out so good that it would not take a lot to make it a little bigger, at least, and uh, hopefully keep the same flavor because it really does have a great flavor. So I highly recommend this plant. Uh, I don't know about commercial uses, uh, but definitely for cross Oh, the plant does need cross pollination, so you need to have. Uh, let me go back. So you need to have two different. Uh, two different seedlings. There are no clones or varieties of fruit. So um, you know what this is? This is the Corbet again, because now we move to the presentation. And this would be for named varieties of fruits, uh, ones that have been uh, better types have been selected and by enthusiasts. And uh, there we go. So one thing is like gooseberries. So gooseberries are not common here, but they're very common and, and very popular in Northern Europe. Uh, one reason they're not popular here is because they were implicated as an alternative host that helped spread a disease of white pines that was introduced into this country in uh, the early 1900s. Turns out gooseberries are not very susceptible to this disease, but the fe they had been banned by the federal government, so everybody forgot about gooseberries, so nobody's familiar with them. And then some of the best varieties were no longer available here. Anyway, they're no longer banned, so they can be grown. And this variety here, a lot of people think all oh, gooseberries are small, tart, and green. Uh, this shows that they're not small. And if you could taste this, you could see it's, it's not a tart. Basically, it's called a cracking texture. When you uh, bite into it, the skin is sort of firm, and then all of a sudden it bursts open and explodes with this ambrosial juice in your mouth. And gooseberries really do, uh, there's many, many varieties. Here's uh, uh, some of the varieties I grow, uh, just to show how different they can look. And also the flavors vary a lot. They vary, some have a grape flavor, some have a plum-like flavor, some have an apricot-like flavor. So the ones that I recommend, which are listed at the top, Captivator, Poor Man, Black Sand, and Red Jacket, and Hinamaka, uh, these are ones that are uh, disease resistant because there are a couple of diseases that gooseberries can get, uh, unfortunately, the very, very best tasting ones are the most disease susceptible. These are very among the very best tasting ones, not the very, very, and so they really taste good, but uh, they're uh, more disease resistant. So highly recommended. Uh, one writer I would quote uh, from about 100 years ago wrote, the gooseberry is the fruit par excellence for ambulant consumption. So you just walk by and eat them. And uh, that I think that's important because a lot of people think gooseberry is only good for cooking, that you have to cook them. But there are dessert varieties and cooking varieties, and dessert ones are really just good for ambulant consumption. And I should point out, Captivator, that first variety is also thornless. Most gooseberries have thorns. But Captivator is an excellent flavor and thornless. Uh, related to gooseberries is, are red currants. Well, red currants, white currants, and pink currants. And these also are very easy to grow. Somebody, uh, once again, about 150 years ago, wrote that the current takes its place among fruits that the mule occupies among draft animals, being modest in its demands as to feed, shelter, and care, yet doing good service. So very easy to very beautiful. Uh, not that much var variation in flavor from one variety to the next. Oh, also, I should, before I forget, I should uh, mention that gooseberries and currants uh, have two really good qualities, especially good qualities. One is that uh, they're deer resistant, deer don't like them. And the second thing is they will, among the few fruits that will fruit in the shade. So currants normally grows a, a bush maybe three feet high, three or four feet high. You can also train them as SBA. So along my vegetable garden, I train currants to a single stem and then with two arms and about three feet high and it really looks pretty and it's an easy way to prune them and very nice way to uh, decorate a fence. The main problem with this is uh, you can't eat the currants or you ruin the whole picture because it really looks nice with the currants hanging there. So fortunately I have other plants that I just trained bushes. So one more relative 
uh, would be European black currant. And this, this is different from the, the uh, clove currant, which is also a black colored currant. This one is very popular in Northern Europe. And this is another fruit that I highly recommend for commercial uh, potential. Uh, not many people like it just uh, straight up, just popped into your mouth, although I do. This is one of my two favorite fruits. But I just like jam, a jelly, liqueur, as in cassis, the main flavor is that. And especially if you grow the best tasting varieties, and I consider the best tasting varieties to be uh, Belarus Gaja, uh, listed in Titania. And very easy to grow, also tolerates shade, and is deer resistant. Another fruit with some commercial potential that takes some handling is American persimmon. So a lot of people are familiar with the Asian persimmons because these show up in supermarkets. The American persimmon is a little different from that. Uh, this actually was a fruit that, interestingly, was becoming very popular in the early 1900s. Uh, and to the extent that a whole USDA publication was written on it. And the publication began that the persimmon has received more criticism, both adverse and favorable, than almost any other known species. And those centuries of bad publicity actually went back as far as Captain John Smith of Pocahontas fame. He said, if a persimmon is not ripe, it will draw a man's mouth awry with much torment. And in more modern in terms, I would say it's like a vacuum cleaner in your mouth if it's not ripe. And even when you spit it out, the vacuum cleaner stays. But uh, the captain did go on to say when the persimmon is ripe, it is as delicious as an apricot. And I would describe the flavor as if you took a good dried apricot and you soaked it in water, pumped it up in water, and you dipped it in honey and gave it a dash of spice. So the astringency is absent in the best varieties of American persimmon. As I said, there are different varieties. And they have to be ripe. So you need a good variety, and it has to be ripe. And there's a myth that frost will ripen persimmon. Frost comes late in the season. Ripening of American persimmons comes late in the season. So they both happen around the same time, but the frost is not the, uh, needed for that. The, the first named variety of American persimmon was selected in 1880. It was called Golden. And now there's um, about two dozen or more varieties that are available. And uh, Many of them are worth growing. In the northeast, uh, the, the main problem is you have to grow a variety that will ripen its fruit within our relatively short season. So there's two varieties that I recommend. Oh, let me just go on first. Uh, here's the tree is quite ornamental. It's got nice bark, nice leaves. So here are the two varieties I recommend, Zucchus and Molar. These are both hardy, I've grown them for decades. And, uh, and they ripen within our season. Molar, where I am, uh, starts to ripen end of August, and Zucchus, uh, end of September. And uh, the, the nice thing about these fruits also, a number of varieties. In the wild, persimmons, uh, American persimmons need cross-pollination, so you have to plant a male tree for you know a few female trees. But these varieties and some other ones, Zucchus, Zucchus and Molar and some other varieties, do not need to be pollinated. Uh, the nice thing about zucchini is also it's quite ornamental. It, it, uh, molar drops, uh, you know, through August and September, into September, but zucchini, the fruit will hang on even after the leaves drop. So uh, as far as downsides, uh, I can't think. Of oh, commercially, it's it's a little hard to handle because when a persimmon is very ripe, it's very soft. So you have to gather them uh, and very and handle them very gently, and they don't keep for a real long time. Okay, moving on to another fruit, medlar. This is a fruit that reached its peak of popularity in the Middle Ages. It was Charlemagne's favorite fruit, and uh, it was often disparaged for its appearance. So you can see it looks sort of like an apple with the stem end, uh, the, the uh, calyx end opposite the stem, flared open. So in uh, Old English literature, for instance, Chaucer named it, called it the open arsenal. And uh, Shakespeare even, uh, spoke about it. He was a little more discreet, calling it the open, etc. My favorite description uh, comes from a writer about a hundred years ago. He he called it a crab looking brownish green truncated, truncated unsympathetic appearance. So the fruit might be ugly to some eyes, not mine, 
but uh, the flavor isn't bad, is is good. Uh, it does have one other quirk. When you harvest it, it's rock hard and white. And so I do a process called bledding, where you pick it and you keep it in a cool room till that uh, inside turns to brown mush. So this is not a fruit uh, that you'll be finding on a supermarket shelf because this does not have eye appeal. On the other hand, the flavor is really, really superb. It tastes sort of very rich uh, applesauce with a little wine added to it. And and you can keep it uh, quite long also. So the, fr the fruit's downfall, admittedly, is its appearance uh, to some people. But uh, on the other hand, the tree is actually quite ornamental. And if you have a small yard, this is a tree that does, need, does not need cross-pollination. And uh, it's a small tree. It only gets to be about eight or 10 feet high and wide and very ornamental in its branch structure. In its flowers, you can see the flowers here. Have this single blossom. The nice thing about this is they open late. So each blossom is cradled by a whirl of leaves. And uh, every blossom goes on to set a fruit. So uh, I would recommend this for backyard. I guess if you had a specialty market where you had some people that knew what this was, they would probably really like to buy one or two or three or more. And then finally, uh, the last fruit, uh, which has a uh, following and a number of name variety, is a papa. So papa has many tropical aspirations. It's the northernmost member of the custard apple family. You can see the leaves have a sort of a tropical-like appearance. And the way the fruit hangs in clusters on the branches, it's uh, very similar to banana. Actually, each flower is a multiple ovary, so it can give rise to up to nine fruits. It, it seems like a fruit that uh, you would not think would be very hardy. But uh, on my property, the papa one winter was below, lower than 30 below zero, and they came through just fine. Here's a tree plant on the mantel. You know, it's nice in the front yard. It's actually at my cousin's house. I, I made this tree for her, and she said people just stop by on the street and ask her what it is because it's so pretty, and they don't know that it also bears fruit. So here's what the fruit looks like. It's often been compared to banana since it has a, a creamy yellow texture, just like similar to banana, and even sort of a banana-like flavor that some people say has uh, a hint of vanilla, custard, pineapple, mango. Um, I, I call it, I think it's most like a creme brulee uh, without the cream and sugar. Uh, one thing not to um, mix it up with, the papaya, which is a tropical fruit, is often called pawpaw, but it's a totally different fruit. They both, both happen to be called pawpaw. And uh, another similarity to banana is that the fruit becomes, uh, you know, sometimes gets some black speckling on it when it's ripe, and the fruit softens a little when it's ripe. Uh, one nice description of this fruit was, uh, oh, so this fruit is native uh, to eastern U.S., as far west as Nebraska, actually. So the fruit actually has been called the uh, poor man's banana, the New York banana, the Michigan banana, the Hoosier banana, whatever state it happens to grow in banana. And uh, James Whitcomb Rye, the Hoosier poet, he wrote, uh, and such puffles, lumps of raw golden green just oozy through with ripe yaller like you saw custard pie with no crust too. So it's very much like uh, vanilla custard and uh, easy to grow. Basically no pest farms, very, very reliable and it's fruit. Uh, the two most important things I think for growing pawpaws is plant a named variety, then you're assured of having the best quality fruit. And the secondly is to plant two trees uh, because you need cross pollination. Also the, the other reason to plant, plant a named variety is if this will be a grafted tree, Is it will start bearing, say, up maybe four years. If you plant a seedling, not only will you not know what the quality of the fruit is, but also it might take even 10 years for it to bear. So the pawpaw, a lot of people think it needs shade. If it's a grafted tree, the wood mature above the graft, so it uh, needs full sun. It's a tree that grows in the shade in the wild, but will actually bear better in full sun. So uh, it needs little or no pruning, no, no, no pest problems really worth mentioning. Uh, just plant the name variety and uh, you'll 
two named varieties, two different named varieties, and you'll get pawpaws. So just a little something about the commercial uh, value. So this was, I sold some fruits just to test market them at Union Square Market in New York City. And uh, this is a market where the prices are quite high. So you can see I was getting $12 a pound for pawpaw. And the kiwis, that size container, I was getting about the same for those. Yeah, I think I was getting $12 or $15 for those containers. And uh, here I am. And we also had uh, we also had American persimmons somewhere, but I don't see them. And for that same size containers, the kiwis, we were also selling American persimmon. So I hope. Oh, one story. A number of years ago, I wrote an article about pawpaws that appeared in the New York Times, and I got a letter from this woman, May Messina, who lived in Brooklyn, and she told me she had the only pawpaw trees in Brooklyn. I had a friend that lived nearby, so when I went down to see him, we went over to see uh, May Messina and her pawpaws, and she did have this, this house in Brooklyn totally surrounded by pawpaw trees. We ate a lot of pawpaws, and actually, as it turns out, perhaps unfortunately, she does not have the only, she did not have the only pawpaw trees in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Botanical Garden had some pawpaw trees. Uh, on the one other bit of information, she was born in Pawpaw, West Virginia. So there's four states that have towns that are named Pawpaw, Illinois, Indiana, West Virginia, and I forgot the last one. Oh, no, no, I did forget the last one. So to sum up, I hope his, uh, his Pomona again. So to sum up, I hope you can consider some of Pomona's other fruits, her secret fruits, uh, both for the commercial appeal, for their good flavor, and for their sustainability. And if you want more information, you can go to my blog or my website, and there's a book that I wrote, Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden, where I have whole chapters on these fruits, and to know about pruning these and other plants, the pruning book. And uh, I guess I could take questions if there aren't. Sure. Um, we, we do have a few questions. And before I give you um, the questions that came over, I just wanted to uh, give an apology to everyone. We had some technical difficulties. WebEx accidentally uh, took off the uh, web address. But you can see the uh, presentation in its entirety uh, on our archive page at nofamass.org. And I'll give that information again when we conclude for tonight. So, Dr. Wright, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. I do have a, a couple of questions uh, concerning uh, there was okay. one question that came through about the um, the gooseberries, and there was a question in terms of what types of pests may uh, affect that kind of tree, if any. Bush. Bush. Okay. Well, gooseberry most has a, is has a, the imported current work can uh, attack the fruits uh, very easy to control with you know even a, a pesticide like a safer soap uh, just as long as you get it at the right time as soon as you, you uh, see it. Uh, basically it's stripped of the in season so if you see that you just spray right down into the bush uh, and then it, it the there are uh, two diseases in thracnose and uh, and um, uh, powdery mildew but the ones that I mm -hmm. mentioned are resistant to uh, powdery mildew and uh, less so to anthracnose. So, you know, you just give them a good site. But those would be the main pest problems. Okay, great, great. Um, another question came in from a viewer about currants. Um, and you mentioned the red lake and the primus. Is there a good time to plant these um, when they're small? Well, I like to plant them in the fall, like mid-October, if possible, uh, just because they they uh, uh, start growth very early. So I'd like to have, I mean, you can't, I have planted them in the spring and they do fine, but if you plant them in the fall, at least they'll be in place and they'll probably have a little, made a little root growth even uh, by the time spring comes. So I prefer okay. the fall planting, but spring planting is not impossible. Okay. Okay, and and I'm going to have a follow-up question to that. Um, out of all the fruits that you mentioned, are there any um, from the, the first set to this third that works better being planted in the spring versus the fall? Um, 
would I have to say generally I like to plant everything in the fall just because I got a lot of other things to do in the spring. But as far as okay. the plant goes, um, there's there are advantages to fall planting. Uh, just that the roots can actually grow in the fall, even though the tops will not grow mm-hmm. until spring. So that's one advantage. And often the soil is in better condition for uh, digging and planting in the fall. Um, and there's a lot to do in spring. So mm-hmm. I, I'd okay. say that as far as the plant, most, mostly it would apply to the uh, to the gooseberries and currants. Okay, great. Thank you. And for those who are watching, feel free to use the chat function to type in a question. And if you're on the phone, you can text me directly at 413-214-1237. Um, another question um, concerning, and this is for all of the fruit that you discussed tonight, um, is proper pruning. Pruning can be a little difficult at times. So is there a particular pruning method that you recommend? Well, each fruit has its own pruning method. Although, as I mentioned, a lot of the fruits that I that I spoke about, for instance, uh, the pawpaws, the persimmons, uh, cornea and cherry, you know, you can really get by with almost no pruning on those. But, uh, you know, basically with fruits, growing fruits generally, pruning is important. In these fruits, it's less important than uh, for, uh, app, for, you know, apples. You have, to do it, uh, you have to prune them annually and you have to prune it correctly. With these, uh, not so much the case for most of them. The kiwis would be an exception. You do need to prune them, you know, every year and prune correctly. Okay, great. Um, another question just came through concerning the American persimmon. Are there any dwarf American persimmons? But uh, they're easy to keep small, and the further north you go, the less large they tend to be. Okay. I think it be the very large trees there. Okay. And this is uh, concerning um, those last couple of slides about the marketplace. How, since these are uncommon fruits, uh, how how do you do with marketing these fruits at the particular markets that you go to? That's a good question. What I do is I offer tastes, and the three, mm. three fruits that I that I was uh, selling: the papa, the American persimmon, and the hardy kiwi fruit. Basically, if somebody tastes them, they cannot help but buy them. Mm. Okay. Okay, that is definitely a good way. Um, for cultivation of uh, particularly the the berries, like the gooseberries and some of the currants, uh, is there any cultivating that takes place in terms of side dressing or? Um, um, I know you talked about pest pressure. Some have it, some don't. But what are some of your recommendations in terms of cultivation as the plants grow or as the trees grow? Well, I know people always like complicated formulas for soil care and stuff like that. Uh, mostly with these plants, I just uh, mulch them, and that's it. And the mulch, as it over mm-hmm. time, as it breaks down, uh, adds sufficient nutrients. I guess if it was a very poor soil, I might add compost or some organic fertilizer and then and mulch. But over over, the, over time, over many years, mulch will supply everything they need. Uh, except mm-hmm. something like with the uh, lowbush blueberry and the lingonberry, I check the soils that they, and use sulfur to uh, make sure it's maintain to maintain the acidity. Okay. But even even that isn't as crucial if you have a high organic matter content to the soil, which happens mm-hmm. from annual mulching. Okay. Very good. And there was a quick question about the very beginning of your presentation about the hardy kiwi. Um, and if that's something that you grow, how successful you are with it, and uh, how does it do when you take it to market? Hardy kiwi, very successful. That's, that's why I highly recommend it for commercial use. Uh, very, very successful, easy to uh, because you can pick them slightly underripe. And then you time it so that uh, your exposure room temperature by the time you get to market, they are ripe. Uh, so they're easy to handle because, you know, when they're underripe, they, they don't bruise easily. Uh, it's just very easy. And if you, especially if you train them the way I train them, so you basically have this roof, you can just reach up and, and pick all the berries off. Okay. 
Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Um, in the last few minutes, uh, a few more questions about the berries. What's the best temperature to get the maximum yield? Is that a berry that will work better in the summer? Can it sustain in the summer? Is it a better fall berry? Um, I mean, all the plants I spoke about do fine in the Northeast. Uh, gooseberries and currants, I said, they're not plants typically of super hot climates. They're, they are plants of northern climates, cool climates. But, uh, you know, some people plant them on, a, on a, if they want uh, to actually to, to, to delay the season to make it longer. They could plant them on the north side of a slope or even in part shade. I grow my... I grow my black currants in the shade of my pawpaw trees. Okay. Very good. Uh, in the last uh, few minutes, we have three minutes remaining. I just want to do a final call for questions if anyone had any additional questions. Uh, if not, there was one last uh, question I had for you just as a backyard gardener. Um, if you were to recommend a particular fruit out of the group that you mentioned for someone who's just starting with that, what would be your recommendation? Well, I guess blackcurrant is one of my favorite fruits, so if, if you liked it, I would recommend that. Um, favorite uh, and easy to grow. Uh, well, just because I, I happen to like it, but, you know, different people like different fruits, so I don't know if I... If that'd be good for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough question. I can't really answer that any better than that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and lastly, uh, and I want to get this question in because it, it, it's an interesting question. Can any of these fruits, and this is coming from someone who's viewing this um, in Alabama, can any of these fruits be grown successfully in the South? Oh, yeah, a lot of them. <clears throat> May pop, uh, the strawberries, uh, just looking quickly through the list. The clove currant, the hardy kiwi fruit could be in there just fruit earlier. Uh, June berries are native in every state, so they could go well in the south. Uh, and then not the gooseberries and currants. Uh, and of course, American persimmon, which is native uh, far south. And pawpaw. Would be would be native down to there also. Okay, very good, very good. Well, that um, brings us to the eight o'clock hour. And uh, Dr. Reich, we really appreciate your time tonight, and uh, appreciate your patience with us as we worked out the technical difficulties, as well as with our viewing and listening audience. Uh, you can see the entire presentation at nofamas.org. Just go to the webinar page and go to archives or you can go to YouTube and go to the NOFA Math page. And in both these areas, the video will be up by Friday. Uh, if you have any questions or have problems viewing the archives, don't hesitate to reach out to me at, NOFA, at Anna at nofamath.org or call me directly at 413-214-1237. Again, we're definitely appreciative of Dr. Wright's presentation. Hopefully everyone will try out these uncommon fruits. Um, and to just give you a quick reminder that our winter conference is coming up in January, please stay tuned to our website to see all the pertinent information so you can get registered and see all the uh, workshops that are coming up at NOFA Mass. Uh, next month, we will have Julie Rawson, who is the executive director of NOFA Mass and also runs Many Hands Farms our, out of Barrie, Massachusetts, and she will be our presenter talking about some of the things that are happening at her farm with uh, livestock as well as rotating them with crops. So I look forward to seeing and hearing everyone next month and uh, have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.